work, my boots on and lace them up. A hard work. So I've been, as I said, I've been at WPI since 1990. Um, so there was a bit of, hey, the, what, do, what do librarians need to know about computer science? Um, so there's lots of traditional areas. So this is my one slide on wearing my computer science department head slide. Um, so that we have lots of traditional areas in computer science. OK, probably many of those things that you've heard. One of the things that I will say, and is absolutely becoming critical and why so job demand for students graduating in computer science is, is going through the roof. Uh, a year ago when students were, students with a bachelor's degree in computer science at WPI, um, for every student that we graduated, the Career Development Center had eight job postings, okay? Lots of students flocking to our courses, majors, minors, uh, whatever. Uh, Good and, good and bad, challenges certainly in, in accommodating the students. Um, one of the reasons that that is happening is lots of interdisciplinary areas. So one of the things that we have done at WPI, and, I, and I, these are actually all real examples of interdisciplinary programs that we have put together involving computer science. I think one of the reasons that computer science, in my mind, is giving more pervasive, it's no longer the technology companies that are hiring our students, the only ones that are hiring our students. I have healthcare firms from Hartford that are up in my office. We desperately need to hire your students, okay? So I, I give admission talks too, and I tell moms and dads why their son or daughter will still likely have a, have a job after four years, is I think part of it is this pervasiveness. And, and part of that is because computer scientists are so increasingly working with these um, other, uh, other areas. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, and I don't know how much this is widely known, certainly in computer science, in terms of where I as a computer scientist go to look for the best research and the top research, we are a very conference-oriented discipline, which puts us in the minority. There are journals, you're probably aware there are journals in computer science, but the best stuff in computer science across virtually all areas of computer science, maybe not the ones that are very mathematical, but across are largely in conferences, okay? And so conference proceedings and having access to that is really where I and my colleagues are looking at for that kind of stuff. Okay, so privacy is a big topic. Okay, so as I said, I've been doing something related to privacy since 2005. Um, privacy is a very broad topic. And let me, let me say a little bit about what I'm not going to talk about. So there's lots of concerns about where your private information or a person's private information that you want to protect it. Certainly, um, there's commercial business environment. What do companies know about you? What does a government know about you? Pick whatever your government is. Certainly with the NSA and Snowden and, and all of that, that's been a big thing. You may be concerned about what your neighbors know about you. Okay? So I'm very much going to focus on the, on the first one here. It's really what can we see in terms of where is information going? And the kind of interesting thing about this, again, I try to measure things. This is what we can actually, the work that I'm presenting has to deal with what we've measured and actually see. And this is not kind of what happens behind the scenes that this company is selling this data to somebody else. The, the great thing about the internet is the traffic is, is open. We can go ahead and monitor the network traffic and actually see where things are going. Okay? Um, so kind of there's three parts of the talk. The, the middle part I'm definitely not going to talk as much on as I have material. I'm going to skip through some of, the, some of that. Um, so the first part and where we started out was this notion of what I, I think I mentioned previously, a privacy footprint. So as users, when we browse the, the web, and I'm largely going to talk from a web browser standpoint. I've done a little bit with mobile. I've, I've done a little bit with you know, kind of what happens for my iPhone or, or from my Android but not so much there. So I'm largely thinking of you're interacting with a, with a web browser of some sort. Um, so one of the things is measuring. So when I go to CNN, I knew CNN before. CNN is a first party site. You or I have chosen to go to that site. That is a first party site. 
we may or may not choose to share information about ourselves with a first party site. You go to Amazon, they ask lots of information from you, that's fine, that's a decision you make. What I'm focused on there is, as part of going to these different first party sites that we're making decisions about, what information is being transmitted to which third party site? So I'm gonna focus a lot on these third party sites, these sites that you're not directly aware of. You haven't made a, an explicit decision to go there, but in going to CNN, your browser is being told to go to other places than your browser does, okay? So we have over, since 2005, over 1,100 of popular first party sites. If we go and we browse those sites, where does, where does our browser go and, and where are the sites that are learning about us? And so we've done this periodically since 2005, okay? So I like graphs, I try to do graphs when I can. Um, so this is a lot of, and, and our screens aren't super big here, so this tries to give a sense of, since October of 2005 until the last time I have data here, August 2013, what is a footprint, what is the, the, the sites that we're going to? So the, the top third party site, um, or the top two that are kind of back and forth is in the, is in the green and the blue here. Um, one is Google Analytics, okay, which does um, something called analytics for um, first party sites. And the other one is DoubleClick. DoubleClick was formerly, it's an independent company that was bought by Google. So both of these are bought by Google. The top line here, um, the red line, um, shows if we, if we look across the top 10, quote, third party sites, what is the penetration? So the, the Y axis here um, is the penetration of our thousand odd sites. So any one of these, Google Analytics and DoubleClick get us about in the 60% range. There's some numbers and, and words over to the right. This is actually a more up-to-date list of popular sites that I put together a, a couple of years ago. And because and, and our 2005 list is kind of growing out of date. Um, and so those numbers are even higher. Okay, so a very high penetration, some others that you might have. Um, Facebook here shows up at 39%. So about 40% of the sites Facebook is aware, or a Facebook server is aware that you are going to that site. Why? Because you know you can share this or post this on your wall or things like that. Okay. So again, you're you're, you're welcome to ask questions as we go through. Um, oh, um, one of the other things we looked at is, as I said, both Google Analytics and DoubleClick belong to Google. One of the things is we combine these by companies or uh, we originally called them empires. Somebody said that seemed a little too uh, <laughs> draconian. So we changed them to families. Families seem much nicer. Um, so the Google family has a penetration of 87%. So Google is aware, a Google server is aware of a, of a thousand odd most popular sites. A Google entity is on 87% of those sites. Okay? Um, Comscore is another big one, Facebook in terms of those. Um, so to give you an idea of the kinds of things that these third parties are doing, one of the things I tried to pull together, there's kind of four um, things. One is analytics, okay, some sort of de data aggregation for the first party sites. So a couple that are biggies there uh, are Google Analytics and Omniture. Um, there is a group of them that uh, serve ads and track user activity, so more prominent there is things like DoubleClick. Um, there are sites out there that all they're trying to do is, is track behavior and aggregate, okay? Um, scorecard research, Blue Kai are, are some prominent ones. And then these no social networking sites showing up on pages with icons so you can go ahead and, and share information. Again, share information you might see on CNN. Um, and so certainly, if we kind of pull out those four and treat those, that we see quite a bit of growth. So when we first started back in 2005, say the social networking sites were down to, uh, to nothing and have grown in our original data set up to 40% and in a more current list of sites, almost 50% here, okay? And sites out there that are, just exist largely to track and gather information now have a penetration of about 60%. 
Okay? So when you go to these first party sites, it's not that there's just one or two of these third parties. There can be tens or fifteens of them on those sites. Okay? Okay. So I've given kind of that talk and that information, and at this point or, or at the end of the talk and, and with more elaboration on what I did, one of the, the, the questions you should be saying, well, what are those sites doing with that information? Okay? You're, you're saying they're getting that information, but what are they doing with it? And so that we set out to try to understand. That one's actually a little bit harder. Um, so that's the part here. Understand what they, these third parties, are actually doing with this information that's available to, to them. Okay? And so we looked at different ad networks. Um, we looked at, to see what they're doing. So, um, and I'll go into some of that. Um, we also ended up and looked at Facebook. We'll see how we're doing on time in terms of how Facebook deals with ads based upon the information you give. Okay. By the way, if there's something in here you want to learn more about, you can find me. So uh, again, computer science at the department at WPI, very prominently at the top of my page is, is online copies of all my papers that virtually all of what I'm showing in here is there. Okay. So one of the things you can do, you may or may not be aware, um, Google as a very prominent, um, and we looked at other ones, but finally I, I'll, I'll skip through here. We settled there, here on um, Google as a, what do they do with the information they do? Well, one of the things you can do is they have a, what they call a Google Ads Preferences Manager. They will actually tell you what they know about you. Okay? Or what they are, more importantly, what they are inferring about you. Okay? So you can go search, if you go and search for Google <coughs> Ad Preferences Manager, and you can go to this page, and based upon the browsing history of the browser you are in, it will give you a page that looks like this. And this is based upon, so what we did is, tried to put together a controlled experiment where we induce particular interests in, say, a clean or a virgin browser and, and seeing how it plays out in terms of what the Google Ad Preferences Manager does and the kind of ads that we saw. So these are, it's things we're interested in, finance and investing, news and weather, uh, sports, uh, golf and golf equipment, which were all interests that we had induced, that we had indicated either by going to websites or, or searching for particular things. We were not trying to come up with a particular demographic, although the set of sites that they were going to, they were guessing that we were over 65 and that we were a male. Okay? Although that was, again, some sites have very strong demographics in terms of if you go to, if you go to NASCAR, you're very likely a male in terms of auto racing. Okay, that's what basically they're doing. Um, so what are the kind of information that these sites are receiving? One of the things that you do is they not only receive information about the site you're going to, but sometimes when you give information to that site, these first party sites you go to give it away. A anybody use Pandora? Okay, I learned about Pandora in doing this. Study. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm really not too hip. Let, let, I, I have a very dumb, okay, flip phone here. Okay, part of the reason because I worry about privacy kinds of things. But um, anyway, um, so your Pandora profile, you give them information. One of the things they send to Google or to double click here, uh, the artist that I'm listening to, the genre, I don't know where they got love, love songs from. Uh, my user is age 32, my gender is one male, and, and the zip code that I have. Okay? So it's not even that, so this information is being sent to Google. Okay? That I had given to Pandora as part of creating an account. I had to do that on Pandora, and they are passing that information along. Okay? So Google, as a third party, is in a position to collect quite a bit of information about one. Okay? So, one of, so the study that, that we did, and I did this with a, a graduate student at WPI, 
um, is we basically treat an ad network as a black box that we can go and have different inputs. So we visited different web pages. Uh, we searched for different things on those web pages. Um, we maybe had a, a particular location that we were at. We provided information in various profiles, such as a Pandora profile. We essentially fed that to our ad network by going to various first party sites. And then we observed two kinds of outputs. We observed this ad preferences manager, like I showed a couple slides ago. And we observed what the ads were that we could actually see. So could we see that information that we're putting in, could we see that showing up in the form of ads coming out the other side? Okay. Um, just to give you a sense of the kinds of first party sites, and this is just a, a blast up here, these are the set of sites, first party sites that we would go and visit, either to, uh, to induce behaviors or to perhaps see ads uh, displayed uh, upon that. Okay? So we saw lots of different kinds of ads. So I would say some of the more benign ads that we might see is one, contextual ads. So a contextual ad is an ad that would be served based only upon the page that we are on. Okay? That no other information is brought in here. So if I go to uh, the New York Times dot com science page, I saw something on brain training games here. Okay? If I'm on Pandora and had identified that I was uh, in the Worcester area and I saw something for the, for the Boston Pops. Okay? Or I had gone to gaylife.about.com and was being given the opportunity to view gay men um, in Worcester. Okay? So those are all contextual slash location, not necessarily using any additional information beyond what was on that immediate page. So, so the question is, so, so on one hand, this is not targeting yet. So the question is, are there things you can do to kind of fool these things? Yes, you can go to lots of sites that you have no interest in, and they'll give you truly nonsense. And people have proposed that. Look, we're going to just inundate them with all sorts of things. The downside of that, you actually may get advertisements that you really are disgusted by. Okay, I mean, you could think about having something that sits off to the side and goes to lots of sites and gives you, quote, a, a uh, you know, a, a behavioral profile that is like, oh my God, why am I getting ads for pornography on my, you know, because, you know, maybe somebody else is doing that. Okay, and you fooled them, but, you know, maybe you're not too happy with that either. Uh, let me see. Um, let's see, we saw a little bit, I'm not going to try and go too much into it. So let me go on. So we induced a number of behavioral interests in various ways of things that we were interested in. So things like cars, dogs, golf, investment. Um, we kept searching about weather in Miami or, or vacations in Miami, uh, tennis um, in various ways. And then we tried to see whether we saw keyword related things um, on the output for those. Okay? Oh, the other thing we did, so this ad preferences manager, this APM over time, as we're doing this, so on a daily basis we would do these sessions. So this we did over a couple, couple month period, e either inducing or not inducing various behaviors, um, is we observe how did this ad preference manager change over time, that screen that I showed you about 10 slides ago. And in, and, and in this case, again, I like graphs, how, did we, how many categories were there? And what we would observe is kind of this interesting behavior is our daily session, one through eight here, we would observe at, during the session, so it took probably about 30 minutes to go through the, the list of 
um, sites that we had, you see that this ad preference manager, some number of categories would get added, and then soon afterwards, by you know an hour or two later, that ad preferences manager by Google, it would kind of go back down. And then over time, we got to some sort of a baseline, and actually where the arrow was at, the captured APM, that was literally what the ad preferences manager looked like at the time where we are at, at somewhere between day four and five. Okay? But this kind of interesting behavior was these blips where if I would go to Bloomberg or I would go to the New York Times, literally whatever was on, the, th those were, it seemed to be a couple that were, that the Google ad um, network seemed to be a particularly attuned to. Whatever was on those stories, it suddenly thought I was really interested in it for a very short time, and then that would kind of go away. So, yep. Is that, is that real time? So, like, while you are on in real time, you get the peaks. Yes. So the, the question is: so these peaks were, say, within the you know twenty or thirty minutes that that we were doing this daily browsing, we would see these spikes in interest, and then it would be okay that that that's not kind of a long term. Um, it, it doesn't persist long term. Okay. Um, so we saw behavioral ads. So here's kind of what I would call garden variety behavioral ads. So I'm being tracked, okay, or our um, daily browser. So uh, clearly I'm interested in golf. Um, I'm interested in dogs, okay. So I would go to another site and I would see uh, ads for golf related ads, okay. That makes sense, okay. I would see ads for canine electric fence. I think any talk you can have a puppy in, that's, that's, you know, it's a nice excuse for a talk. Okay, so not, nothing too surprising there. Okay, but it, it clearly evidenced that, or appears to be evidence that, hey, because of my interest, I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, this stuff. So let me, let me give you a graph. Again, here's things I have. So here are a number of categories Cars, dogs, golf, investment, Miami, and tennis along the bottom. Um, the blue lines, or the blue bars, are what percentage of my sessions I saw an ad for that um, if I was not inducing the interest, and the yellow if I was inducing the interest. Okay, so what that says, the cars, the very first one says, I see lots of ads about cars, whether or not I seem to be clearly showing an interest in it. Okay? Um, dogs, I never saw any ads related to dogs, except if, in sessions or in, that I, periods that I was explicitly uh, inducing that. Okay? Um, the ones with the asterisks are ones that we actually showed, that they showed up in this um, ad preferences manager. All right? So it was a little bit odd that, that cars didn't show up in this ad preference manager, but on one hand that may be something that they um, always show ads for. Um, we also tried to look at more sensitive interests. Okay, So Google as an ad network says we do not show behavioral ads for sensitive topics. And so um, things like uh, bankruptcy, uh, depression, diabetes, so medical conditions, sexual orientation, pregnancy, skin cancer were other ones that we tried to do this same kind of thing, induce or not induce them as interests. And we saw various kinds of ads for that. Um, and so here is the results we saw. So we didn't see as many ads for these interests. Okay. The only one that we see a really big discrepancy of whether or not we induced it again in the yellow was the depression, the second one over. Okay, So there's some question. So Google could say, well, we're not really serving ads based upon these criteria okay? because we always serve ads, although if one of these criteria apply, it appears, it could appear that um, that that interest is is invoking ads. Okay. Um, we also looked at Facebook. Question? Yep. Um, so you're seeing the, the interests on Google's APM spike as you're browsing, and then they disappear quickly thereafter. 
but the numbers go up across daily sessions. Presumably, as you return to material, um, Google is recognizing that you have a persistent interest in it, which means they're keeping information about your browsing habits that they're not showing in the APM because, other, because otherwise they would spike and then go down, spike and then go down. Right, so, that, so that's, a, that's a good observation. So the, the, there's kind of two terms, and back to this APM and that spiking bit. They're both doing something immediate and short term, but then they're also kind of keeping stuff in the background. Do we have enough persistent interest that we can move it to a kind of a long term thing? Okay. The other thing that I forgot to do, if you go to this page, you know, they're more than happy to allow you to correct the things that they have um, <laughs> induced about you. Okay. All right. Okay. So why are they happy to do that? Because they're happy for you to actually confirm that no, I'm not a 65-year-old male. I'm a you know, you know, and and so that they have more accurate information. Okay. Okay. Um, we look. We also tried to look at Facebook whether or not if I put things in my Facebook profile, do we think do we see them show up? Uh, or not. I think I'm going to, so we saw if I'm interested in biking, we saw ads on biking. I'm actually not going to try and go through, there was some, a little bit dodgy behavior in terms of how they dealt with sensitive stuff. Uh, check, out, check out our paper if you're interested more. Okay. Um, let me get to the last part and, and kind of finish up here. So one of, so one of the questions somebody asked me ahead of time was, so, so what does this mean? And and what should we do about this? And, and I'll try to at least talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, so one of the things I'll make a conjecture here is in order for there to be unwanted dissemination of private information to a third party, we need the presence of three conditions. Um, there has to be information that is leaked. OK, one. Um, there has to be a way to link together that information. So one common way to link together information is Google, or if their ad network double click is doing this, they use this notion of a cookie. I don't think I've used the C word yet. Um, they have a cookie, and that cookie persists in your browser, and so that same cookie is associated with behavior across different sites. So that's what allows an ad network such as Google and many others to go ahead and link together the information they are receiving. If they are unable to link together information they're getting from CNN and Pandora and other sites, then that, at, from a privacy standpoint, that makes it a lot better for the, the user. Okay, And the third one is that we need to have a non-trivial lifetime for that information. If that information goes to double click and then immediately goes away or very soon thereafter goes away and is never recoverable, then we're good. Okay, And so I'm going to go through these three um, in terms of what we might be able, that if, and, and my contention is that if we can eliminate any one of these three conditions, we can prevent link, leakage, or if we could prevent linkage, or if we can prevent longer lifetime for that information, we're good and we don't actually have privacy concerns. Okay? And so I'm going to have one slide on, on each of those in terms of whether that makes sense. So what if we eliminate data lifetime? The last one on my list. Can we say that, that information persists only a short amount of time? So the, probably the most prominent and visible that you have there is, and, and again, I don't have this, but I understand this Snapchat, that I can send somebody else a picture, and that picture only persists within this Snapchat application, what, three seconds, 10 seconds, something like that. And then it's gone, OK, and not recoverable. Okay, and so if we could do this with information, that, that Pandora example I gave earlier, if that information went away, that'd be great. Unfortunately, having some way to do that in a very reliable manner is real difficult. Okay, even something like Snapchat, it's the application itself that is doing that. It's not necessarily that that information is no longer available. Okay, and doing that on a larger scale is, 
is even harder. Okay? So what about getting rid of linkage? Okay, I used this C word. I talked about cookies. Can you simply turn off cookies or turn off third-party cookies? Browsers allow you to do that pretty easily. Unfortunately, there are lots of other techniques that are showing up that allow linkage to happen beyond just cookies. So there's something called browser fingerprinting. The way this browser on this machine is configured is fairly unique in terms of the, the extensions and the add-ons and the particular versions of those that the exact combination any one has is, a, is pretty unique. Um, your IP address, your internet address, okay, doesn't change all that much and with some of these other. Globally unique identifiers, um, email addresses, um, usernames, social network identifiers, on mobile phones, every mobile phone has a unique identifier. Your mobile phone there is a unique identifier attached. That unique identifier gets sent out. Okay? Google has proposed an ad ID um, as a replacement for cookies, which is basically a browser identifier that every Chrome instantiation would have its own unique identifier. Okay? So just eliminating cookies, there's lots of other vectors that information can get out. Okay, on uh, leakage, okay, can we prevent that? Well, one question, and we had first done this a few years ago, I just went back as I was putting this together, and I said, is this leakage still happening? Okay, so, I, so one example is this Pandora example is still happening. Okay, um, AARP, unfortunately they start sending me stuff. I, I'm really not old enough, but they somehow think I am. Um, so information, they store in a cookie uh, your email address, your first name, and your zip code. Well, it turns out that, well, you can say, well, this is a request, this is a HTTP request to a server called metrics.aarp.org. Well, that's not a big deal. Metrics.aarp.org looks like a uh, aarp.org server. Well, it turns out this server actually belongs to Omniture. So even though it looks like it's going um, to ARP, it's actually going to a third party. Um, Expedia, this one actually always bothers me. Um, so when you go search for information, I want to go from Boston to Orlando on these particular dates. That information gets leaked. So here, I, let's see, what's my example? Here I, was trying to, oh, here I was trying to go from San Francisco to Boston on 2013, October 16th, 2013, October 18th. Okay, I was trying to make airline reservations. That information got leaked to Castle Media and Scorecard Research and Ad Technus and Ad NX and Point Roll and dot, dot, dot. Okay, and unfortunately Expedia is not alone. Okay, WebMD, I go to WebMD and say, hey, I'm interested in pancreatic, re pancreatic cancer. That search term goes to Scorecard Research. Okay, which is one of now the more prominent third parties. Yes. So that's a, good, so that's a good question. So the question is, um, what's the benefit for WebMD to do this? And in fact, one of the questions, and I, and I don't completely know the answer, is where, which way is the money going? Is scorecard research getting money because they're on you know, Web, or WebMD or, or vice versa? Okay. Some of these companies are giving information and kind of providing summaries to WebMD you know, about who are the who are the folks and what are they interested in, okay? Um, scorecard research is, is a funny one, and I'm not entirely sure, even though they're pretty prominent, I still don't have a good sense about what they're doing. All I know is they are in a position to collect, you know, a lot of, a lot of information about us, okay? Um, so how do we prevent this, this leakage? The, the first thing, and, I, and a few years ago I wrote something that, that 
Sites that are in the best position to prevent this kind of leakage are the first party sites themselves, the WebMDs, the CNNs, the Pandoras. And we write this. Do the first party sites change? No. Why not? Well, partly because I don't think, in some cases I think some of this leakage occurs because perhaps those sites um, were not as careful as they could be. And in fact, when we would publish some of our results, it's, people would say, oh, that's just the way the web works, or this isn't intentional. That's, but the, the fact that these things are not changing is concerning because what, turn, what may have started out as being unintentional and inadvertent has now become convenient that these third parties are in a position to learn this. Okay? Um, certainly, the notion of ad blockers, and perhaps some of you do use ad blockers, they are kind of a, a even there they don't have a good, I don't, I don't think users have a good idea of what's being blocked and, and what's not being blocked. They do know people that use them. I tend not to use them, not because I don't necessarily believe in them, but on one hand because I'm trying to also, as I kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to understand what's what's actually happening out there. But I think that somewhere going in that direction as users that, that we're going to need to do. Um, so my last slide here, so what can a user do? Okay, um, and, um, and this isn't maybe, so there is very much a tension out there of, you know, users inherently, you ask users in a, in a survey, the Pew Foundation or various folks, we've done it, I ask users, are you worried about uh, you know, sharing of information and protecting information? And absolutely. But when it gets down to actually doing things to pro potentially protect that, that's, uh, that's hard. And on the other hand, these, the fact that we have these ads on these first party sites, okay, the first party providers or the advertisers say, hey, this is exactly what users want. They get content for free. Okay, or it's essentially paid for with these advertisements. Okay, um, there was actually a very interesting paper when I was at this, I said I was at this Privacy Law Scholars Conference just this past Friday down in DC, trying to question whether the notion of behavioral advertising was really worth it in the collection of information relative to other things like contextual advertising, which I showed, um, arguing that perhaps contextual advertising is good enough and we don't need to collect all this inform information just so that we could do behavioral advertising. Um, certainly there are things you can do to slow aggregators down, uh, refusing cookies, blocking content. I think, and, and I think, you know, um, it makes it harder. It doesn't make it impossible. Okay, there's some kind of semantic solutions in terms of trying to have a better understanding of what's going on there that I'm trying to think about. And, and certainly at the bottom line, if, if there's something you really don't want to have out there, be very careful in terms of putting that out there because once information in terms of expressing an interest or suddenly being interested in something, it will likely get linked to you. Okay, in a sense things like maybe your gender and your zip code, while on one hand those look you know, a little weird. There's a lot of instances of that out there. It's kind of that really unique information about you that perhaps is even more problematic. Okay, and I'll come back to my opening slide. Not too bad. Questions? Maybe we can take a question or two before we come up. Um, is this is this CPD specific? Or does it matter, for instance, if you use a lot of public access computers and then you have a computer at home? Or oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. So is this particular to a, a computer or is what if you use lots of, lots of machines? Well, that's where actually some of these globally unique identifiers show up. So if I'm a Facebook user and I have a desktop machine, I have a desktop machine that sits on my desk and I log into Facebook at, in the office and then I go home and I have a laptop there and I use that at home and I maybe have a, another computer. If I'm logging into Facebook in all those situations, Facebook very clearly or anybody else getting that Facebook ID is saying, oh, these are three different locations, but they're all the same person. Okay? That because that, that is a globally unique identifier that, you know, who I am. Oh, this 
Isn't money, isn't that what commerce, isn't that what makes everything go? <laughs> well, I mean, I, when I think about pri my privacy concerns, targeted advertising is annoying, and that kind of stuff, you know, or just advertising in general would be annoying, but it seems to me it's not the biggest concern. So, and, and so let me go back to where I started from. I mean, you may have come in here with certain ideas here, and, and, and I may have not changed anything at all, and that's fine. And you may say, I'm entirely comfortable with all this, and I'm not saying you're wrong, okay? Some of you may say, okay, where can I get an ad blocker installed, okay? Or, you know, unplug your computer now, okay? So there's all, it's, it's a very interesting, for me as a computer scientist, so I'm not a social scientist, a computer scientist, is to just to see the range of reactions of where of where people are at and who you're worried about. You know, yeah, are you? I guess I'm just, my, the, my question is more the, so other than for advertising purposes, is there some other reason people track this stuff or people are collecting? Information? Well, the, the federal government's probably, your defense agencies probably, and again, we didn't study that. They're probably not worried about, you know, you know whether you want to purchase a particular book or a particular camera. But you know, there's other things they're worried about in their tracking. And there's no reason to believe that private companies are going to put up a lot of resistance if the federal government comes calling with a subpoena, or in some cases not. And, 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 says, and that's oh, actually business you've got. Be ashamed if you lost it. And that's actually a very interesting question. Is think about the third-party profile that a company like Google has, and that the U.S. government shows up and says, "Hey, we want to know." where this user has been, because in a sense, an advertising network such as Google with the sheer presence that they have in terms of seeing across the internet, forget about them as a search company, forget about them as a, as a um, you know, email service, just if you look at, at sites and they know the set of sites as a, as a prominent third party. So the question is, could, is, there, is there something good here for a library? Sure, I mean, you could have, you could install, you could have your little kind of third party and everything, and you observe, you know, the users that come into the library or use your, you know, s machines or go through your, you know, search services, and you could learn, and maybe there is software out there that will tell you, and that you'll pop up little things instead of ads, you'll say, hey, maybe you're interested in this. And it can be customizable. Even though we may be ask, they may be able to reveal things about themselves. It's not the librarians don't necessarily have to connect that to the person, but we could find out that a lot of our users are interested in I don't know whatever would be sensitive, um, and that could be helpful. Right. I mean, so and certainly there is. I mean, there was a few years ago I was on a Federal Trade Commission panel looking at behavioral advertising again. The, the advertiser saying, this is what users want. You see relevant ads instead of this, you know, garbage ads that you have no interest in. You know, you're seeing ads that are relevant. Yeah. We know you like dogs. We know you like golf. We're going to show you ads that are relevant to that. You know, that's our... All right. Maybe we should... Well, we should maybe quit so I don't get us too often. I think you can take a few more questions. I can, really. A little too okay. I had a question. So we're talking about ads... So, so the fact of Target and what I understand of Target and where somehow it was, the, the credit card machines were hacked, that really becomes a security issue that, that they were not being secure and they allowed essentially unauthorized access into their system in order to, that somebody could then gain access to whatever private information is stored. So that, that would not be so much in the purview here of what we were. I know there was another. Um, you alluded to your flip phone earlier, and I wanted to know if you were serious and was that in jest, in terms of your reason for having a flip phone versus a smartphone. 
Uh, somewhat. <laughs> so, so one, I, I, I'm still comfortable not knowing what else is happening out in the world every single minute. Okay, that's one. But two, certainly, yes, uh, you know, again, I, you don't, I mean, I can show some examples here. You don't know, completely know what is, what is out there and what is, what is being learned. But certainly there's having a very powerful personal device like that that's always on you is, there's a lot of information to be mined there. Now it's likely that it's only with your provider that has direct access to that. But. Well, I know like now with the iPhone, I'm sending all of your information to the cloud, so. Oh, the cloud, that's a great term. What's the cloud? <laughs> yeah. Who's the cloud? <laughs> People have no bloody idea. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, so how does the ad, how does this work if somebody's paying like $10 a month or something? Is that something that I'll, I'll be I'll be honest. I, I I don't I really don't know a lot about Bitcoin, so I'll I'll I'll, I, I'll say okay. I'm I'm not an expert there. And even though I was called an expert earlier, I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> right there. I was wondering about the um, leakage of information about you, like you you're the first party because they're targeting you. But how about when apps ask if they can look at your contact list? So if they have access to your contact list. Doesn't that kind of jeopardize your friends' privacy as well? Oh. So the question is, so you 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 get an app. You so apps have shown up in a couple different places originally, and we studied this a bit with um, social networks like Facebook have quote third-party applications. You can go get Farmville and 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 play that. Or it's clearly now with mobile phones, uh, you know, um, third-party apps. Um, in both of those cases, they're asking for access to information, and it's typically all or nothing. You know, we want, you know, sometimes they'll tell you all the information that they want. There's been studies that they, those third party applications are not using as much as they're asking for, but on one hand, certainly that that's a, that's a problem. It's taking information about you or about your friends and your contacts and making it again available. So we should yeah, and you could say no, and then they'll say, fine, we won't, we won't let you download this app. So that's where they, see, that's the, the problem with some of this stuff. You can say, I'm really interested in privacy. I'm not going to let this, I, you know, and if somebody asks you about it, they, you know, you, you do a survey about it, I'm really interested. And then you get this, God, there's this really cool app that I can do this. Oh, it wants me to do that. Oh, okay. And, 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 and you go. I mean, so, you know, that, that. There's kind of two decisions there. It's one in the absence of some immediate something you want. Well, you can say one thing, but when that it's it's like you give us this information, or we're not going to give you this app, that so becomes a very different. So it's an ethical problem. It's an ethics problem. Ethics problem. Uh, <laughs> it's psychology. It's I, yeah maybe a psychology problem. Psychology. Okay. Anyway, I okay now I think I'm really past my two thirds. So thank you all.